Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome back to another true crime video. So the case that I have for you guys today is a very recent case and there's not a lot of information out there about this case and it's been said that there is a lot of misinformation about this case and rumors. So I just wanted to jump on here and cover this case and hopefully put things together in a way that makes sense in a timeline that's easy to understand and put forward any information that I think is the most credible and the most reliable so that we can hopefully find answers for these four murders. This video will cover the recent killings of the four students at the University of Idaho in Moscow, Idaho. The four students involved in this attack include 21-year-old Kaylee Gonsalves, 21-year-old Madison Mogan, 20-year-old Ethan Chapin, and 20-year-old Zana Kernodal. So, a bit of background information. These four students were all students who went to the University of Idaho, like I said, and lived in a college town called Moscow. Moscow has a population of around 25,000 people, and before these four murders, there had not been any murders recorded in Moscow for more than seven years years. So, students on campus said that they felt very safe around the campus. They felt safe walking around at night or leaving their bikes unlocked around campus. However, these murders have shaken up the entire college community. Many who live around campus said that they left the campus and went home for Thanksgiving early because they're afraid that there's still a killer loose on the campus. Others said that they're taking a lot more safety precautions, such as walking only in groups around campus and not going out after dark. A coffee shop on campus said that they've also changed their hours so that all of their employees are off before dark so that they can get home before dark. Some of the professors on campus have even said that they think that classes should go back to being remote for the remainder of the semester to keep the students safe. So now I'm going to tell you a little bit about each of the four victims victims in this case. 21-year-old Kaylee Gonsalves was from Rathdrum, Idaho. She had been set to graduate a semester early in December of that year. After graduating, Kaylee planned on moving to Austin, Texas with one of her close friends, Jordan. Kaylee had actually secured a job already at a marketing firm in Texas, and she was so excited to move away from her home state and explore more of the country. Jordan went on to say that Kaylee just wanted an adventure. Jordan said that she would suggest super last minute and spontaneous plans, but Kaylee was always down for the adventure. Kaylee had shared a dog with her ex, who she was still friends with at the time. We will actually discuss more of her ex in just a few minutes. Kaylee was also in the Alpha Phi sorority, and her little described her as, quote, Kaylee was someone who was kind to everyone. She never failed to put a smile on any of our faces, and she loved silly pranks, being around her friends and family, her dog Murphy, and traveling. She was always looking for an adventure, whether it was spontaneously booking a trip across the world or a quick road trip. Kaylee was the best big sister I could have asked for. She made me feel welcomed and loved when I first joined Alpha Phi, and she was the reason I did. She had a contagious laugh. I could always go to her with anything I was struggling with. She made everyone feel included. She was determined like no other. She set her mind to something and had to have slash do it. She was loyal and never talked negatively about anyone. To live like Kaylee would be the biggest accomplishment as she was the most determined and kind person I knew. She still is all these things and more though she may not be physically here, we know she is watching over all of us and we will miss her and cherish our memories with her every day. We will continue fighting for justice for these four innocent angels as we know that that is what Kaylee would do. She was a fighter. As your sister, we look forward to seeing your smiling face again someday, Kaylee girl. 21-year-old Madison Mogan went by Maddie, and she was from Coeur d'Alene. She was majoring in marketing. Maddie's grandmother described that Maddie was always gentle and caring. She cared greatly for her long-term friendships and made sure to stay close with her family, including her extended family. Maddie had a boyfriend named Jake who said that she was so, so excited about graduating next year. He said that Maddie was a positive person who brought acts of kindness to others. Her boyfriend said that he hoped people remembered her for her kindness and the love she showed and the generosity she gave to others. She was also someone who loved adventure and she too was excited to explore the world after graduation. Her boyfriend said, quote, there's no words that I can really describe her, how amazing she was, and how wonderful of a person she was. 20-year-old Zana Kernodal grew up in Idaho, but she spent some time in Arizona in the recent years, which is where her father lived. 
Her father described that Zana was someone who was never really worried about drama. She was just never really into that. She just liked having fun with her friends and was never really into materialistic things. She was always with her friends and just liked having a good time. She was a tough girl who was responsible. She had been helping out her boyfriend, Ethan, in his own studies, which really impressed her father. Then, Ethan Chapin was from Conway, Washington. He was one of a set of triplets who he was really close with. It was said that on the day of November 12th, 2022, he spent the majority of his day with his siblings who are also students at the University of Idaho. His mom, Stacy, described him as being the life of the party. He made everyone laugh and he was just the kindest person that you could know. Now, all three girls, Madison, Kaylee, and Zana, all lived at a nearby off-campus residence in Moscow. In addition to these three roommates, they also had two additional roommates and the five of them lived in a three-floor, six-bedroom apartment, and Ethan, who again was Zana's boyfriend, was visiting them at the time that this all took place. Zana and Ethan had been dating for about a year at that point, give or take a couple of months, according to her father, and Ethan also was a student at the University of Idaho. The six of these friends all seemed to be pretty close to one another, on Instagram, you see that Kaylee posted a picture of all six students together with the caption, one lucky gal to be surrounded by these people every day. It was said on the day of Saturday, November 12th this year, they all went to a football game that afternoon. Then later that night, Ethan and Zana went to a party on campus at the Sigma Chi fraternity at around 8 to 9 p.m. I believe this was some sort of formal that they usually do at frats. I was never in a sorority or anything like that, but I know they hold formal and those kind of parties. It's not always just the kind of parties like a house party like you expect. So I think it was more so like that kind of party through the fraternity. Then Maddie and Kaylee, they went to a bar called the Corner Club at around 11 p.m. and they stayed there until around 1.30 a.m. Then going into the early morning hours of the next day, so November 13th at around 1.41 a.m., Madison and Kaylee stopped at the late night food truck called Grub Truckers. This food truck had been doing a live stream to Twitch, so this live stream is what captured the girls at the truck and ordering their food. They ordered about $10 worth of carbonara from the truck and they waited about 10 minutes for their food. As they waited, they could be seen chatting with one another as well as with other people surrounding the food truck as they also waited for their food. The manager of the food truck is 26-year-old Joseph Woodall, and he said that when he saw the two girls, they didn't seem to be in any sort of danger or distress or concern. After getting their food, Kaylee and Madison then returned back home. It was said that they got their ride home from a private party driver. It was originally reported that they used a rideshare service like Uber, but it was changed and is now being reported as a private party driver. So I'm not exactly sure what that means, but that is what's being reported. Then at some point, Ethan and Zana also returned back home. It was said that the two of them returned home at around 1.45 a.m., but I wasn't able to find any more information about where they went, if anywhere, after this frat party. So I don't know if they spent their entire night at the frat house and they were just hanging out there or if they went to local bars after that. I thought I saw in one source that they did go to a local bar after this party, but I could be wrong. I think I saw it somewhere. I tried finding it to confirm it and I couldn't find it again, so I could totally be off. So all we know is they went to this frat party at 8 to 9 p.m. and then they returned home at around 1.45 a.m. and I'm not exactly sure where they went, if anywhere, between that time. Then a neighbor's security camera captured Kaylee and Madison returning home at 1.56 a.m. Then on the morning of Sunday, November 13th, one of the roommates on the first floor called another friend asking them to come over after they found one of their roommates on the second floor. They said that this person had passed out and they weren't waking up. Once this friend arrived at the apartment just before noon, someone who lived in the house called 911 to report that their roommate was not waking up. 
We don't really know any more about the 911 call. This is all that's been reported, that it was one of the roommates at the house that called and it was just before noon and that it was said that all they saw was that their one roommate was not waking up and they just looked like they were passed out. When police arrived, of course, they went into each one of the six bedrooms that they had in the apartment. Now, like I said, this was a three-floor apartment with two rooms on each floor. The two roommates who lived on the bottom floor were the ones that noticed that one of their roommates on the second floor had been passed out. Then, the two remaining roommates lived on the third floor of the apartment. So, police went around the apartment looking in all of the different rooms, and that is when they found that four victims had been brutally stabbed to death. These four, of course, include Kaylee Gonsalves, Madison Mogan, Ethan Chapin, and Zana Kernodal. So, that means that the person who killed these four other roommates had snuck past the two roommates on the first floor, and the two roommates who lived on the first floor, they didn't wake up during any of this. They didn't report that they heard any sort of noises. They didn't hear anybody come in. They didn't hear anything suspicious the entire night, and they had no idea that their friends had been stabbed to death until that next morning when the police arrived. The police came out and said that these two roommates were out of town on Saturday. They were out of town separately doing their own things, you know, with their own families or whatever, and then each of them returned back to the home at around 1 a.m. on the 13th, just before the other four roommates returned home from their night out. All four bodies were obviously sent to the medical examiner for an autopsy, and it appeared that each of the four victims had been stabbed with a large knife. However, investigators were not able to find the murder weapon at the scene. They also found that there was no signs of forced entry into the home. It was said that this was sort of a party house that a lot of people had access to, so there was a lot of people coming in and out all of the time. So I'm sure that's going to make it a lot more difficult to get DNA and to wean out, you know, who was supposed to be here, who wasn't. Was this perpetrator here at one of the parties? Are these fingerprints, you know, the person who did this or someone who was just here because they were attending a party at this house? Now, one of the doors to the home has a keypad that requires an access code in order to unlock the door and access the home. So, it is possible that someone who had previously been there who knew the access code just used the access code and got in that way. Kaylee's sister admitted that they weren't the most private with the access codes, so it is possible that this code was shared with the wrong person. The house also does have a sliding glass door, so that also could have been used to access the home. The police are not quite sure at this point where this person gained entry or how. And like I said, there was no murder weapon found within the home, so they have yet to find out what the murder weapon exactly was. It is thought to be a big knife, but they don't know, you know, the specifics of this knife, and they also don't know where it is. So, they haven't found it at the home, so it's assumed that the attacker took it with them and who knows where it could be at this point. Police said that it appeared as if at least one victim tried to fight off their attacker, who they believe was Zana. However, it's possible that all of them tried to fight off their attacker. None of them showed obvious signs of sexual assault, and toxicology reports have yet to be completed and it was said that they think that all four victims were asleep when they were murdered. Now, people have said that Zana fighting off the attacker the most out of anybody shows that she has a lot of fight in her, and I do agree with that, but I also think that it could mean that, you know, because her boyfriend was over, they most likely were sleeping in the same room in the same bed. So, to me, that says that the attacker probably went after Ethan first and then woke Zana up and it kind of gave her enough time to like come to and figure out what was happening and then try to fight back with the attacker and obviously she did end up being murdered and overpowered by this person but I think the fact that she did fight off the attacker the most out of anybody, 
I think that that shows that she was woken up before she was stabbed versus everybody else was initially attacked when they were still asleep. So that is the background information of the events leading up to the murders and then obviously the murders. Now I want to discuss what the police have said in the aftermath and what the investigation has found this far. So first, it showed that in the early morning hours of November 13th, Kaylee had made seven phone calls to her former longtime boyfriend, Jack DeCour, who is also a U of Idaho student. All of these calls went unanswered. The first call to Jack from Kaylee was made at 2.26 a.m., so about an hour after they were seen at the food truck. Then there are six more calls over the course of 26 minutes from 2.26 a.m. to 2.44 a.m., and then there was a final unanswered call at 2.52 a.m. Then it was shown that Madison had actually called the same number that morning, so to Kaylee's ex-boyfriend. There were three calls made from Maddie to Jack. The first phone call was at 2.44 a.m., and then her last phone call to him was also at 2.52 a.m. Kaylee's mother, Christy, also came out to say that she spoke with Kaylee on that Saturday, so November 12th. The two spoke on the phone one time during that day at around 3 p.m., and they were talking about making plans for Christy's birthday, which was that upcoming week. Kaylee told her mom that she was going to be taking her out for breakfast, lunch, and dinner all on her. She was really excited to celebrate her mother's birthday with her and make it a very special day for her. Then, just a few hours before the murders, Kaylee sent her mother a text message with a picture of her and her room. Roommates. Now, of course, with these repeated calls to Jack just after the students got home and around the same time that it's possible that these murders took place, obviously, police looked into Jack. Police basically said that they can't be certain that he isn't involved, but as far as what I have seen, it doesn't seem like they're really going down that avenue anymore. Kaylee's family also said that they stand behind Jack 100% and they do not believe that he's involved. They had been dating for a few years up to that point. They had a dog together and then they had just recently broken up and it was said that this was a very amicable breakup between the two of them and that the two remained friends and that there was no bad blood between them. Kaylee's family has said that they will continue to stand behind him because he too is grieving alongside the family. Christy said, quote, we are supporting him and we know in our hearts and our minds and our souls and the depths of our soul that Jack is hurting. Now, at this point, there are no suspects. Obviously, there's no arrests and there's no real motive identified here, but police have said that they have ruled several people out those who are ruled out include a man who is seen interacting with Kaylee and Maddie at the food truck that night, the man who gave Kaylee and Maddie a ride home that night, and then the two roommates who were home during the attack, and then the friend who the roommates called over the next morning when they found that one of their roommates had been passed out, and then they also ruled out Kaylee's ex-boyfriend, Jack. Initially, after these attacks, police came out and said that they don't believe there's any imminent danger to the community at large. However, three days after the killings, police chief James Fry said that they actually can't be sure that there's no threat to the community. Police say that they consider these murders a crime of passion, but they cannot say for sure. They're also not sure whether the person has fled or if they're still in the area. The one report from police that has been consistent throughout all of this is that they do believe this was a targeted attack. Police have also said that they followed up on over a thousand tips, interviewed over 150 people, and collected over 100 pieces of evidence, but we don't know where this has led investigators to this point. They haven't publicly identified any persons of interest or any suspects at this time. So that's pretty much all of the information information that we know on this case. I know this was a much shorter video than I'm used to putting out and that you guys are used to watching, but 
I wanted to make sure that I put all of this information out in one place in a way that's easily digestible and a timeline that makes sense for you guys instead of seeing like, you know, different tweets about it and trying to put together the information yourself. I hope that I was able to put all of this information together in a way that makes sense to you guys because I know that I've been trying to follow this case. I've been seeing a lot of tweets about it, seeing articles here and there about it, but some of it doesn't really make sense. And then I've heard a lot of the families saying that, you know, with this lack of information that police are providing, there are rumors that are being spread. So I just wanted to make sure that I get this information out there so that it's all in one place and that hopefully it's as accurate as possible and hopefully we can, you know, weed out all of the information that's rumors or not true to put out exactly what we need to know about this case to try to get more eyes on it and to try to get this case solved as quickly as possible. As of right now, we don't know where in investigators are in terms of finding suspects or how close they are to solving this case. I just wanted to spread awareness on this case and of course, as I will with any recent case, I will be keeping you all updated on any information that comes out about this case in the coming weeks. I personally do think that this could be the case of a targeted attack because of the fact that this intruder walked right past these two roommates who were sleeping on the first floor and they went upstairs and attacked the roommates who were on the higher floors. Not to sound vulgar or anything, but it would have been a lot easier to take care of the first two roommates who were on the first floor rather than going all the way upstairs stairs and risk being caught by the two other roommates who were sleeping in their rooms. So that makes me think that this definitely was a targeted attack against these four individuals. But I don't really know how they could have been targeted or why, because again, it didn't seem like the four of them really did everything together that night. It seemed that Ethan and Zana and Maddie and Kaylee were doing separate things that night before the four of them eventually returned home. So I don't know if somebody, you know, followed Kaylee and Madison or Zana and Ethan home, saw that there were two others that were awake in the house, and so this person just decided to kill all four of them, and maybe they didn't even know about the two roommates sleeping in their rooms on the first floor. Honestly, I have no idea. I think it's very lucky that they slept through all of this because I genuinely think if they woke up during this and tried to do something about it, that their lives would be at risk too. So I don't think the two roommates are involved. I think it's very possible that especially if they were drinking, they were just in their rooms. I sleep with earplugs in personally. So, you know, we don't really know. Maybe someone sleeps with the TV on. So I think it's definitely possible that they could have slept through it. Again, police have ruled them out, so I don't want to speculate about them, but I honestly don't know what would make someone want to kill four people all in one go and not kill the other people that were in the house. So once again, I do think this was a targeted attack, but I have no idea how they identified these four individuals as the people that this person wanted to kill. So I don't want to speculate too much further. I don't want to cause any harm in this case. I do just want to spread awareness about the case, about each person and who they were, and try to get this case solved as quickly as possible. This truly is one of the more horrific crimes that I've seen in a very, very long time, so I'm just hoping to get more eyes on this case, and I'm hoping that by putting the information together in this way makes it make a lot more sense for everybody who watches this video. Hopefully, if anybody lives in the area or goes to that university, maybe seeing their stories and having it all in one place will jog someone's memory if they remember something or encourage someone to come forward if they do know something. I want to remind all of you that when it comes to a murder investigation, any information can be useful information, even if you think that something that you know is totally insignificant and won't make a difference in the case, it might actually be exactly what the case needed to be solved. It might be that tiny little puzzle piece that the case needed to just connect everything together and to make the bigger picture. So please, if you have any information related to this case, please email tipline at ci.mosco.id.us or call 208-883-7180. So that is all of the information that I have for today's video. This is one of those cases where I am very confident that we will get answers within the coming months, if not, you know, within a year. 
I do think this case will have a lot of updates because of how recent it is. So if I hear anything, if I learn anything, you guys will be the first to know. Make sure you keep up with my Twitter. That is where I post the information the quickest. So if you want to keep up to date on this case or any other case that I'm following, please make sure you go ahead and follow my Twitter because that is where all of that information will be. But either way, that is all I have for today's case. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to turn the notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. As you can see, I don't always post on my normal Tuesdays, so sometimes I come out with an extra video here and there, so make sure you have the notifications on so you don't miss out on any of my videos. Make sure you go ahead and follow my Twitter and Instagram. Both will be linked down below, and if you have absolutely any any case suggestions, please make sure to send those suggestions over to my email at rachelshannoncases at gmail.com. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye!